Hi, okay, here's a brief lecture on the last reading we're going to have in this class, the Jennifer Saul paper. Um, let me just give you a little bit of background to say where we are overall. So we started off everything by reading Frege on sense and reference. Um, from there, uh, if you like, there are, we, we can think of two problems that Frege addresses there that uh, the rest of our readings sort of branch off and look at separately. So the first one is uh, has to do with uh, empty names like Odysseus or empty definite descriptions like the present king of France. Um, Russell, Strawson, and Donnellan all address that sort of problem. Um, I mean, it's a little bit unfair to them to say that's all they're doing. They're They're doing much more, but we can think of sort of that branch of our readings. Another branch, uh, another problem Frege identifies is problems of what I've called substitution failure. So here is an example of that sort of thing, right? So we know that Clark Kent and Superman are the same person. That is, those two names, the name Clark Kent and the name Superman, both refer to the same person. But there are some sentences where substituting one of those names for the other takes us from true to false. So the sentence, Lois Lane believes Clark Kent is Clark Kent, that seems true, but Lois Lane believes Clark Kent is Superman, that seems false. Now, Frege would say, Frege does say, um, when you substitute one name for another one, if the reference of the two names is the same, then the reference of the sentence as a whole should be the same. And since the reference of a complete sentence is its truth value, that means the truth value shouldn't change. So Frege's solution to this, um, this uh, sort of problem, or at least this kind of example, is to say when you have what he calls context of indirect speech, so things like Lois Lane said that, Lois Lane believed that, and so on, um, those kinds of contexts, those kinds of sort of sentence structures change the reference of the words involved, and that's what causes what looks like substitution failure. So he'll say, when the word Clark Kent appears here, after words like Lois Lane believes that, it no longer refers to what it normally refers to. Instead, it refers to its normal sense, likewise for the name Superman. So these two names in this context don't actually have the same reference, and that's why you get a change of truth value when you make the substitution. Okay, on the syllabus, we have a reading from Quine that addresses this sort of um, problem. Um, Philosophers after Frege, or sort of 20th century, 21st century philosophers, don't tend to talk as much about indirect speech context. They talk instead about propositional attitude reports or sentences. Um, don't be too afraid of that. A proposition is something like a sentence. Um, words like Lois Lane believes that or Lois Lane hopes that tell you about a relation she has, an attitude that she has towards some proposition. So. Here's something that, oops, here's something that looks like a proposition, what I've highlighted. Clark Kent is Clark Kent. That's a complete sentence by itself. We can think of that as expressing a proposition. When I say Lois Lane believes that proposition, I'm telling you about an attitude she has to it. She stands in the belief relation to it. Okay. Now, so Frege says, if we sort of change his talk about indirect speech and talk about propositional attitudes, he says that those kinds of contexts change the reference of the words involved. So whenever you have um, a propositional attitude report like this, you must preserve the customary sense of the words involved inside that propositional attitude context if you expect substitution to preserve the truth value of the sentence as a whole. Um, put very briefly, the Quine paper you're going to read says not all propositional attitude contexts do that. He says there are some cases where we can make substitutions. Okay, there are some cases where uh, even this substitution might be fine. Lois Lane believes Clark Kent is Clark Kent. Lois Lane believes Clark Kent is Superman. I'm not going to go into detail about that because we had a strike. Okay, so Frege says all and this isn't quite right, but he says something like all of the interesting cases of substitution failure are cases with propositional attitude reports and all cases of propositional attitude reports are going to have this pattern. Quine disputes one direction of that equivalence. He says some propositional attitude report sent, reporting sentences aren't like that. Saul disputes the other one. She says, look, we can get some cases of exactly the kind of substitution failure we've been talking about that don't involve anything like propositional attitudes or indirect speech. So 
In the rest of the video, I'm going to talk you through the beginning of Saul's paper. Um, not the whole thing, just the beginning parts. Um, which is going to make this seem kind of like my uh, lectures on Russell and Frege, where I also went through their papers. But um, it's worth saying the reason I'm doing that in this case is kind of the opposite. So the reason why I go through the Russell and Frege papers uh, with you sort of almost line by line is because they're, at least I think, they're hard, right? Um, they were written 100 plus years ago. Um, they're very dense with uh, arguments that can be difficult to tease out if you don't know sort of the background, what kind of questions they care about, um, some symbolic logic in the case of the Russell paper, um, that sort of thing. With the Saul paper, actually, I think this is, once you've done the rest of the readings for this class, you'll be able to follow this. And I think that's uh, delightful and remarkable. This is partly a credit to Saul's writing, but it's also because um, you're, you, I think you're up to speed on, um, I mean, not every move that's been made. Lots has been written about substitution failure since, um, since Frege, since uh, Quine, that's the other person. Um, so, you know, you, you don't know everything, but I think you know enough to be able to follow the arguments, at least, as long as we're <clears throat> careful with a bit of terminology. So, let's talk this through. Okay, here's how we open up. So, a great deal of attention has been devoted to propositional attitude context. We just ran into those words. Those are ones I think you wouldn't have recognized from our earlier reading because we haven't run into that kind of terminology. But this means, you know, something like Frege's indirect speech contexts. Why? A key reason is the substitution of co-referential names, that is, names that have the same reference, in otherwise identical sentences which ascribe propositional attitudes does not seem to preserve truth conditions. In other words, we get substitution failure when you substitute co-referring names inside propositional attitude reports. Okay. Uh, little attention, however, has been paid to substitution of co-referential names in sentences which do not report propositional attitudes. Why? Because substi such substitutions are taken to be unproblematic. It has been common for um, uh, philosophers to think the sort of substitution failure we just talked about only happens when you have special words like believes that, hopes that, said that, etc. And when they aren't there, it's fine. But here come some simple sentences, that is ones that don't have any fancy special words that seem to be causing the problem, which evoke anti-substitution intuitions quite similar to those evoked by attitude reporting sentences. Okay, don't read too much into the word intuition. This just means when you look at it, seems like substitution fails, right? When you look at an example like sentence one, it seems like that's, that if we imagine that that's true, then it seems like one star would be false. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so there's one example. Clark Kent went into the phone booth and Superman came out. Imagine that that's true. Imagine that's a story about something that happened with Superman. Uh, Imagine that scene. Now imagine you said one star. You said Clark Kent went into the phone booth and Clark Kent came out. That would seem false, right? The story we're imagining involves him running into the phone booth, doing a quick change and flying away, wearing a cape and having taken off his glasses. But one star sounds like it's saying he went in dressed as a mild-mannered reporter and came back out still carrying his, you know, notepad and glasses and so on. Okay, what's going on? <clears throat> Saul asks, there's no propositional attitude verb in one. There's nothing like believes that or thinks that or hopes that or anything that could be the problem. There isn't even a psychological verb of any kind. Go is simply not the sort of verb that we expect to be involved in substitution failures, and yet it is. Now she's going to give you a bunch more examples. I won't talk you through these because you can read. Um, I think I'm pretty persuaded by these. You might find some of them you think, um, I don't see why one of these would be true and the other false. You might think, uh, maybe you look at some of these five pairs of sentences and say to yourself, I don't think that I don't have any intuition about substitution failure here. These two sound like they're saying the same thing. But if any of them work, that is, if any of them seem like you've got a pair of sentences where one could be true while the other is false, then there's a problem here to be explained. Okay. What's going to happen in the rest of the paper now is Saul's going to go through existing accounts, existing accounts of 
um, truth, uh, sorry, of substitution failure. So even if other philosophers have agreed that um, sentences with propositional attitude verbs cause substitution failure and maybe other kinds of special verbs, um, modal verbs, or um, Frege talks about direct quotation, um, even if philosophers have agreed that those are the problem sentences, they have disagreed about exactly what's going on. So something a little bit funny about this particular paper, um, as opposed to uh, other things Saul's written on this topic, uh, something a little bit funny for you about this paper is she directs a lot of her effort, um, particularly in sort of the second half-ish of the paper, to uh, defending a view that you haven't encountered yet. So she's going to try and say, here's this view that uh, tends to get dismissed out of hand. I think if you think, um, sorry, let me put this more carefully. Here's this view that tends to get dismissed out of hand when we're talking about propositional attitude reports sentences with those special words. But that exact kind of thing, that exact kind of response seems like it's perfectly plausible, maybe better than the alternatives for these simple sentences. But if you want to say that that kind of, uh, that kind of account is good for these sentence, these simple sentences, then you can't dismiss it for the more complicated ones. Okay, I say that's a little bit funny for you because this has to do with, you know, um, uh, uh, defending the little guy as far as who counts as the little guy in the debate as it was in 1997, or given the way academic publishing works a couple of years earlier. Okay, I say that's a bit funny about this paper as opposed to the rest of what Saul's written on the topic. She's got a whole book about this kind of problem and what it means for how we should think about um, uh, what kind of evidence we get from our semantic intuitions, those sort of feelings you get about like, well, if this sentence is true, then that one's got to be true as well. Um, one sort of move you'll see her making, and I'm going to leave you to read about it, uh, you will see her talking about uh, uh, pragmatic explanations of what's going on as opposed to semantic explanations. Let me give you just a rough and ready um, description of what's going on there. So first of all, um, the very first reading we had before I even gave you any lectures, one that I canceled a lecture on because of the strike, uh, was from Grice, a, a paper called Logic and Conversation. Don't be scared because it has logic in the title. It's kind of about how, um, in a sense, it's about how you shouldn't, well, let me not say that thing. Don't worry about the logic. Um, the important thing that gets identified there is something called conversational implicature. The general idea there is sometimes when you say a when you um, when you say something to somebody when you make an assertion it doesn't have to be an assertion but let's stick with assertions when you assert something to somebody we can distinguish between what it takes strictly speaking for what you said to be true or false distinguish that from what further things you might communicate by saying that thing. So here's one standard example. If you say to me, um, uh, my car's out of fuel, do you know where I can get petrol? I can, a, a perfectly normal way for me to answer you would be to say something like, <clears throat> yeah, there's a, there's a station uh, just around the corner. Imagine that's, that's it, that's the end. I just say, there's a station around the corner. Imagine furthermore that you then go around the corner and see there is indeed a uh, uh, what I'd call a gas station. I don't know what you call it. Um, there's a petrol station, um, but it's been closed for decades. It's just like derelict there. There is a station, but this doesn't help you with your problem. You can't buy fuel there. You might come back to me and say, why did you tell me there was a station around the corner? There was, there's, I couldn't, I, I couldn't get fuel there. Um, if I'm, a jerk, I might say to you, look, all I said is there's the station. I didn't say you could get fuel there. The thing I said was true. Grice is going to say, uh, sure, what I said was true, but I very clearly communicated something further. When you ask me, do you know where I can get fuel? And I tell you there's a station around the corner. Um, he has a theory that explains why this happens. Uh, but very clearly I'm communicating to you, there's a station around the corner and you can get fuel there. This will solve your problem. I'm telling you something relevant to the question you asked. 
Okay, this sort of concern with what might be, uh, what we might do with language, what I might communicate beyond just what I've said, um, is a part of what linguists and philosophers of language call pragmatics as opposed to semantics, which um, is the sort the sort of branch that's concerned with what's been said. What did I strictly speaking say? What would make it true or false that there is a station around the corner? Okay, as we've been reading uh, Frege and Russell and Strawson, yeah, Strawson um, and Donnellan and Quine, those people have all been concerned with semantics. They're all trying to figure out what exactly is being said in these sentences. What is their logical structure? What makes them true or false? What can we do to them? How do we chain them together? How does that sort of thing affect what's been said? Now, Saul is going to consider in this paper, and I'm, I'm dragging this out partly because you, get, you have an exam question that uses these terms. Uh, one sort of response that she looks at here is to say, the pragmatic stuff, that so, those sort of concerns about what further things um, you might communicate by means of asserting a given sentence, that's what explains our intuitions about them. So you might say, Look at these first two sentences, one and two. Clark Kent went into the phone booth and Superman came out. Clark Kent went into the phone booth and Clark Kent came out. It might be that those two have the same truth conditions. That is, maybe semantically, there is no substitution failure. Maybe it is true that, strictly speaking, either both of them are true or both of them are false. You can't have one true without the other also being true. But it might be that there's a pragmatic difference between them. So imagine when you might say those things. Well, it might seem appropriate to say one star. Clark Kent went into the phone booth and Clark Kent came out only in cases where he went in and he came out and he looked the same. It might be appropriate to say one only in cases where um, he came out dressed in spandex. He went in wearing a, a suit and a hat and came out wearing spandex. Okay, and maybe that further bit of communication is so clear that when we look at number one and try to picture that situation, we wind up picturing a situation where it looks um, clearly inappropriate to assert one star. And maybe we sort of, our intuitions get that confused with um, that inappropriateness we confuse with falsity. Okay, so that's one kind of answer she's going to look at. So you have an exam, an exam uh, question asking you, um, explain and assess what that would look like, that sort of pragmatic explanation of the phenomenon. So you'll want to say something about what pragmatics is. You, it is not mandatory, but it might not be a bad idea to explain what conversational implicature is. You didn't have a lecture on that, but you do have a reading where you can read up about it. Um, I'm happy to talk about it. If you do take on this exam question, I will bear in mind the degree of difficulty. I know that you haven't had a lecture on it. That means I'm expecting less perfection than usual. Um, I'm going to leave you to read the rest of this all paper. It's fun. It's I, I really like this paper. I think you will too. Um, if you find yourself having trouble keeping in mind, you might, if you find yourself having trouble keeping clear on um, who is defending which view and what's an objection to what, I would encourage you to write it down. I would encourage you to use that Socratic note-taking format that um, I showed you um, early on in this module when we had a strike and not a pandemic. Um, I think it'll really help here. But yeah, I'm happy to answer questions about it, but I'm gonna leave the lecture there. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>